everybody, my name is Shortline614, and welcome back to episode 4 of Shortline's Real News and Comment. And today, we are going to be talking about something that has garnered a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion over the past few days, and that is Parallel Systems' frankly bizarre proposal to quote-unquote reinvent Intermodal. Now, what is Parallel Systems? Parallel Systems is a Silicon Valley tech transportation company founded by four former SpaceX employees, and they seek to revolutionize Intermodal through this bizarre design of theirs. Let, 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 let's take a look. Let, let us scroll down and see what their proposal is. There it is in all of its glory, which is instead of the traditional Intermodal train with a locomotive and, and, and well cars and whatnot, you have this, a pair of autonomous battery-powered trucks that you slide underneath an intermodal container much like an old road railer that are coupled using magnetic coupling that can go up to 50 cars or more that can go directly to origin to destination without any without any you know engineer conductor or specialized locomotive or, 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 or stuff like that and there's a lot wrong with this proposal i do think there are some things right about this proposal but but first of all let's get into let's get into what is bad about the broad, the broad overall concept? And there is this Ars Technica article that kind of goes into, uh, kind of an interview with them, kind of goes into some of it. And, and there is a lot here about the broad overall concept that I think is downright stupid. First of all, they treat the rail network as if it were the road network. Now, the rail network and the road network are two completely different things. I can go out and I can take my car and I can drive on as long as it's not a private road, any road, in the United States, I don't need permission from a dispatcher, you know, the roads are designed to have hundreds of thousands of millions of people on them at once. The rail network is not like that. I do not have unfettered access to the rail network. And 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 frankly, they're, they're dispatchers, I have to deal with other trains and whatnot, and, and this more or less treats trains as if they were trucks and the rail network as if it was the road network, which it is not. Not to mention those uh, the trains can only be up to 50 cars and they, they call their trains platoons and they would eat up rail capacity now one thing you need to know is that running longer but fewer trains actually uh, opens up capacity it, there's more capacity when you run longer but fewer trains than if you ran shorter but more frequent trains and and that's part of the reason why uh rares recently have been running these longer trains is because it, it, it frees up capacity and capacity is super expensive to install, and in some cases you might not even be able to install it. Like, for example, like through the, the through the Kuntai River Canyon in, in northern Minnesota, there's only room for one track. You can't add a second track if 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 you tried, and that's part of the reason why BNSF is buying Montana Rail Link. But that's a whole other story. See my video on that or the Bill Stevens article. Um, and you know, uh, adding in a second track in many cases is, is it's super expensive, a million, two million dollars per mile of every new track. And it, it also assumes that railroads would e replace existing intermodal with, with, with this system, which they aren't because it would effectively abandon economies of scale. Part of the reason why intermodal service is the way it is right now is intermodal service is a very low margin business. There's not a lot of money to be made individually from an individual carload of intermodal compared to an individual carload of say coal or chemicals it's part of the reason why railroads focus on these these long big intermodal trains over over well trafficked corridors it's because that's the place where intermodal really makes money and is really honestly economically viable with current technology and it, it also assumes that rares would pretty much abandon, not only abandon economies of scale, but abandon their current operating pra practices, which derive from the economies of scale, which um, which they're not going to do. They're simply not going to do. And that, that's what's bad about this broad overall concept. Now, what, what is good about this broad overall concept? Because the concept of this, you know, maybe not the design specifically, but the concept, I do think there are some good things. Now, let's, let's provide a few examples of where something like this may be useful. And let, let me get out my Canadian Pacific North American Rail Network map. And I absolutely love this map because it shows all the major Class 1 rares in North America. And I'm not actually going to use CP. I'm going to use CN. And this, this is a real example. So a ship docks at Prince Rupert, British Columbia. The containers are then loaded onto a train and they are taken from Prince Rupert 
through Western Canada, down into the United States, past Chicago, and they're taken to Newton, Indiana, this little town right here. And they are, the train is then given to the Indiana Railroad, and the Indiana Railroad takes it to Indianapolis. Now, not all of the containers on that train are headed directly to Indianapolis. A lot of them are headed to places such as Louisville, Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, Toledo. Now, how does it get there? Well, as it currently stands, that the containers are unloaded in Indianapolis and then they're put on a truck and that truck takes them to their final destination in those cities. And that short portion, that 100, 200 miles or so where it's on the truck, that is called drayage. And I do think that there, you could potentially replace trucks in drayage with a system like this. So instead of loading it onto a truck in Indianapolis, you load it from one train to another, you break off a section of the train, and then it can go to these cities and maybe there's a terminal there where you can transfer it from train to truck, so only the last five miles over truck, or even better, you can have it directly go to a rail serve warehouse. So you could effectively convert drayage moves to all rail. And I, I do think another place where this would work exceptionally well is in port to terminal transfer runs. Now let's look at Long Beach. Long Beach has been in the news a lot recently because there, there's a backup of, of, of ships there and there's a lot of ships waiting to get into Long Beach. And part of the reason why it's so congested is the port of Long Beach simply does not have enough space to store all the containers at once. So what could you do? Well, you could run shuttle trains from the port of Long Beach to an inland storage area where you can store those containers, simply get them out of the port, allow more stuff to come in, send them to your inland storage facility, and then they can wait until this time for them to be loaded onto an intermodal train and shot off across the continent. I also think this would work perfectly for short-haul intermodal because, as I said, it's it's autonomous, you know, you integrate the, the rail car and the locomotive, that can cut costs a lot, and intermodal is a low-margin business, so that brings up by cutting your fixed costs, you can bring up the margins, and that could potentially make it you know, attractive and, and profitable to the major class one rares. And you're already starting to see this because, you know, the people themselves, the parallel systems themselves, they have said directly that their proposal, the success of their proposal hinges on class one major rare involvement. you got to get them interested in this proposal. And Union Pacific CEO Lance Fritz says that he is very much interested in this proposal and he's going to keep an eye on it. So that signals to me that yeah, even though while it may not be the best design, maybe the design be terrible, the broad overall concept of something like this is something that the major rares would be interested in to potentially expand their services in a few years. And not to mention, it has the potential to revive, you know, branch and secondary lines and, you know, tracks that used to go to an industry and whatnot because those can become rail served again because it's all rail. Now, what, what, what is exactly is good about this design? Now, there are some things I think are good about the design. The fact that it's autonomous, cut costs. The fact that it's battery powered, uh, environmentally friendly. The fact that it, it integrates rail car and and, um, and 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 locomotive into one also cuts costs and are maybe even cuts down on total complexity. Now, there is a 500 mile range, but I don't think that's going to be a big of a deal because what this would actually be used for is more of those shorter haul intermodal moves that are not over 500 miles. Not to mention battery technology is getting better, so maybe that that could be a potential improvement. And and in this Ars Technica article, I know it's just a painting, but this concept of the micro terminal, where you can basically make pop up intermodal terminals anywhere where you have a, a stretch of track in 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 a, in a gravel lot, and you can make mini intermodal terminals for a lot of these services. I think that is an exceptionally good idea. Now, of course. What is bad about this design? Well, for example, the main thing is that it has two non-connected trucks. It's not an actual rail car, it's just trucks you slide underneath the container. Kind of reminiscent of the old road railers, although not exactly. Uh, a closer example would be the Long Island Railroads. They, they basically tried something like this in the 1980s and it didn't work, it was unreliable as hell. It, 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 it just didn't work. And the magnetic coupling, I don't understand why they went for magnetic coupling instead of traditional couplers. Traditional couplers are heavy, so I guess that cuts down on, on, on weight, which would be my guess. But that makes it so that you can't interface this with any other traditional rail cars and effectively isolates these trains, their, their own little bubble. They can't be attached to a larger train. So if you have, and not to mention, you know, I, I, I'm going to assume that that 50 car limit is based off the strength of these magnetic couplers and whatnot and the strengths of the forces and whatnot. And, you know, you can't, for example, 
take a train from point A from a port to an inland area, have it break apart, and then you could have it go to its different locations. You have to run, you know, instead of running one train that breaks apart into five trains, you have to run five individual trains, which, as I said, eats up capacity. And, yeah, there... <laughs> As I said, the, the broad overall concept isn't bad, but it's just this design. Now, now, what could be improved about the design? Well, go for something more traditional. Instead of having two separate trucks, simply convert an existing intermodal car to be self-powered, an existing well car. I know um, people have thrown around proposals of, of converting uh, switcher frames for something like this. Replace the magnetic coupling with standard coupling. That's just, that's just a given and whatnot. And honestly... Instead of this, converting it to a standard well car, that would allow double stacking. Some lines are only where they're short haul and remote. A lot of lines out there, they're only they're only able to handle double stacks because of the well cars. Because the well cars lower the height of the painters and whatnot. And plus, well cars can actually support double stacks, which I don't think this can. And, and let's be honest, the designs like this have been around for a real long time. I think... In the mid-1960s, uh, John Neeling, the professional iconoclast himself in uh, Theodore Calfield, they proposed the integral train concept, which is not the same, but it is remarkably similar of, of, of you know, merging kind of locomotive and rail car and, and stuff like that. And honestly, I, I feel like something a bit more akin to that would be perfect for, for, for what they're proposing here. Now, a lot of people out there are going to say, a lot of people have already said that this is a grift. And I, I'm going to use an example because the people the people involved in this, they come from the aerospace industry and I'm interested in aerospace and I'm going to use an example from the aerospace industry. Every now and then, you will see an aerospace company come out, they'll pop up out of nowhere and they'll come up with a, with a big fancy proposal with a really lot of nice renders and they'll get millions of dollars in funding and then they will disappear. They, you won't hear from them again. And this is somewhat common this is somewhat common within the aerospace industry um there was a group that was you know wanted to build a, a ring station or there was another group who wanted to mine asteroids or half of what blue origin does could arguably fall into this category where are my engines jeff um and uh but one of the first things when when these proposals come out the first things that everyone in the aerospace industry asks when a proposal comes out is where is your hardware because hardware is everything it is an entirely different thing to say that you're going to do something and put out a fancy render. And, and then when you actually have hardware, that tells everyone that you're actually serious about it and it's not just a grift. So, <laughs> aerospace industry grifts are far worse and it's a lot of work to put into a grift. So personally, I don't think it is. I know I'm probably going to get a lot of disagreement on that, but you know. But but in summary, what, what do I think of this? Well... Terrible design, good concept, terrible design. And I, I honestly think something like this should be tried. We should be trying stuff like this. And sure, we're not going to get it first time. Sure, you're going to have your fair share of people who are who will just write it off as a stupid idea and whatnot, or as a grift or whatnot. And, but honestly, mo when you look at back at the history of railroads, most good ideas were tried a few times before they succeeded. Intermodal, for example, was, was, was something that originated in the 1920s and it didn't work mostly due to government regulations and whatnot it was tried you you saw you saw tfoc and flexi vans and whatnot eventually we got the system that it is today so i do think something like this is worth trying i am going to keep an eye on this if it does truly turn out to be a grift i will correct myself as i said i don't think it is and generally yeah i i, I think this is a this maybe not this design but the fact that people are considering this concept a con concept like this is a step in the right direction. Anyways, thank you all for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.